Okay, so the title of this talk is Distributed Patterns. Um, I've talked a lot about this recently at various places, so um, you know, if I'm rehashing some stuff that, that you guys have seen, like I apologize. Uh, but by show of hands, um, who here has seen me talk on uh, messaging patterns previously? Okay, about half the room. Okay, good, because I didn't cover a lot of that uh, in this talk. Um, who was at Cascadia last year? Okay, not too many. Okay. And who's going this year in this room? Oh, awesome. Whoa. Okay, this is great. <laughs> you guys are in for a treat. Um, okay, so um, I, I had a really, I was presented a really great opportunity two years ago, and that was basically to greenfield a uh, distributed platform from scratch. And um, this talk is, is less about the patterns exactly, but more like things I learned along the way. Um, and, and so um, I'm going to cover a lot of stuff, not a lot in depth, but like stuff that you can maybe just put in the back of your mind for like when you come across these problems to just kind of, you know, uh, keep in mind what worked for me. Um, so, I mean, it was really exciting. This is like a two-year project that's like come to fruition and it was really fun to do and learn a lot of things along the way. So, um, you know, we'll just get started. So, I go by Syntaxi online. I'm mostly well known for my work on Harp and PhoneGap. Um, the company that I started with Rob Ellis is Chloe, and we were working on Harp, which is a static web server with built-in pre-processing. And who here has heard of Harp? Great, awesome, and you tried it out. Okay, cool, awesome. Okay, so Harp is a web server uh, that gives you the pre-processing. It's a little bit like it, it suits Jekyll in a lot of like similar use cases, but it's, it it behaves a lot more just like a static web server. Um, now we also been working on the Harp platform, which is a really great way for distributing putting Harp applications into production. So uh, Cascadia JS, for example, is using Harp. Um, <coughs> So anyways, to, to move into things, but I really like, so given this opportunity to build this distributed platform, we're a team of four, okay? So a lot of the decisions that were made were made um, for, for productivity. Fighting complexity and controlling complexity was, was, we had to be really relentless about this. And I would suggest this for a team of any size, but I think that we were, we had a little bit less room for error on this, so we had to really, really think a lot before writing much code. And, um, and we had to you know, rewrite some things when it didn't, wasn't written properly. But um, this is ultimately what, what I want you guys to take away from this, is just like constantly be thinking about how to fight complexity, uh, because that's really what our job is. When you properly contain complexity, you can really, like, the, there really is no upper bound limit on what you can do, um, but as soon as uh, the complexity isn't tamed, that's when, like, your, what you're capable of doing starts to fall apart, and adding, adding more bodies does not help this. In fact, it makes it worse. So, uh, this is like uh, a crude overview of what our architecture looks like. I think there's like a small piece here which, is, which isn't really addressed, but more or less it, it, it comes down, to, um, it comes down to, to having all these different components that can scale independently. So we've got our, uh, our, our app servers that actually serve the requests that are coming into like your customers moving your application, which are, which are all edge cache. And then we have our platform server, which is like our portal where you manage your application. Um, we, and then we have these deployment servers, uh, which handle the, the synchronization between your Dropbox. Oh, I didn't even mention that. Okay, so our platform it uses Dropbox as a deployment mechanism. So, but we hand that job off to these servers to, uh, to sync between Dropbox and S3 and prime the caches if necessary and and so we, we basically like tackled this by building a lot of really tiny components uh, like 
about 30 modules uh, that are pretty much all written with, um, with Node.js and they communicate over message queue for the most part uh, using Zero MQ. So, uh, lines of code, uh, although it's like, we all know it's a really poor measure for productivity and you know, we'll be the first to remind our, our product manager that lines of code is not good for that. It, it's actually very, very good at measuring complexity. And uh, so it, it's actually worth keeping an eye on what this is like and it, or how many lines of code each module has. And of course, like your whole system can be millions of lines of code as long as it's broken down into small components, right? Uh, so it, it really comes down to usability and graphicability and getting the right balance between like each module doing a level of abstraction that, that makes that component more useful. So what, what I tend to shoot for is I think like two to 400 lines is the sweet spot of, of when like, and there's no rules on this, but like when you start to get, you know, into like four or 500 lines of code, 600 lines of code, and you see it growing, it's time to start thinking about how you can break that up into smaller pieces. Um, another important thing is, is network latency and these computers are incredibly fast and there is a point when we as humans start to notice when they slow down, but almost every operation, single operation, is so incredibly fast on its own that it can go undetectable by humans. So what I try to do is I try to put this mental model in my brain um, that just like reminds me of, of, of the consequence of, of what I'm doing when I'm making a request over the network or I'm, I'm, uh, I'm talking to the file system or talking to a cache. So it comes down to, to this. Uh, and I think that like this is, this is a very, very crude diagram, but I think as web developers, this is, this is the foundation and this is what we should all have in our mind, um, which, is, which is that you've got your process, you have the RAM on the machine that you're running on, you have disk, and then you have network. Now, in this particular case, and the way that I'm going to break this down, think of the network as, as like S3 or something like that, right? Really, like once, once you go over the network, really you can do anything after that. But the point here is that when you reach, when you reach out of the machine that you're on, now anything is possible. So there's benefits to that. Um, that, that like that you need and sometimes it's necessary like like scaling to, to store lots of data or whatever. So the first is the process and I like to think of this as putting like a hand on the note, right? So if you need to know something quick, you can just put it on your hand and, and you can you can access that very, very quickly. But as you can see you can't fit a lot of information on your hand, right? So you want to use this fairly sparingly. And if you're working beside somebody, they can't really be like checking your hand for that information, right? So it's really only valuable to you to have that uh, information written on your hand. So it's very similar with a process and like anything that you cache in a process, it's not benefiting the other processes. Um, so I, that's the way I like to think of, of setting like a variable or having a cache in, in process. Now RAM is, is very similar, but it's a little bit more like a notebook. So you can just like keep some notes that are very handy. You can keep them in your knapsack or whatever. You have them with you all the time. If someone asks you to look up some information in your notebook, it's not going to take you very long, right? So I like to think of RAM as like that. Disk. Anyone have an idea of what disk might be? Disk is like going to your local library, okay? And going into, you know, checking out the Dewey Decimal System and like looking up this information. And it's pretty handy. You can, there's a lot of information there. And there's a lot of books at the library. And you can even 
move and check them out, right? And take them with you, put them in, put them in your knapsack as in RAM or whatever. But you can't possibly put all of the library in your backpack. Um, it would be very heavy and slow. Um, and you wouldn't get very far. <laughs> so, the network. Um, any, any idea what the network is like relative to the other things? <laughs> Alright, so the analogy I use in my mind is if I'm, if I'm doing a, a query or a call over the network, I think of it as going to YBR, getting in a plane, and flying to like New York City. Okay? And likewise, once you're in New York City, then it's very similar to the other analogies. If I'm accessing something from, from the disk, then I'm going to the library in New York City, right? So it, it's, it's important, like what, what's important here is that relatively speaking, they're, they're very, there's a very large penalty to going over the network compared to like going to RAM, okay? And that's, that's what's really important. And like, it's not that flying to New York City and back takes that long, like it's still indistinguishable by humans until you're doing more like several of these. So, but it's important to keep in mind that it, it, it's obviously very inefficient to fly to New York and back 30 times in order to like fulfill one request, right? So, it, it's really helped me to keep this mental model in my mind. So, that is, you know, a takeaway that I give you. So, it basically breaks down to this, is that processes are fast, and network is slow, but process is volatile and on the right would have durable. So you need both. And if if these compromises didn't need to be made, like these mechanisms wouldn't exist um, because this these are basically the laws of the universe that we have to uh, adhere to. All right. So this is totally jumping into another another. Uh, sector, but basically um, when, when, when architecting a system from scratch, okay, it was really important that, and I think that everyone should be doing this, is separate your customer system completely. Uh, so the, the authentication mechanism, what their first and last name is, and whatnot. Um, who here has worked somewhere or worked on a system where they had to merge accounts from one system to another in some way. Okay, most of the room. Um, it, it's a real pain in the ass, isn't it? And it, it happens like every company has made this mistake, it seems. Like, like I've, I've gone through account merging with Google, account merging with 37 Signals, like it happens to the best of companies. So even if you're building like a really, really simple application that seems really, really like, you're like, oh, there's no way, there's no way, like I can just throw this in there, no problem, I'll just add another model to my Rails app or whatever. Just don't do this because it will, it will bite you in the ass, like at some point. So keep your customer system separate. This, this whole like, system that we have here is completely anonymous. There is no mapping to customer in the system whatsoever. So the mapping is done on a different machine that we even keep in a different data center. So it's like completely separate. So if someone had access to this data, they would have no way to map it to an actual person. So that, it's a really simple mapping that you can do at the edge. And all of this can just work with UIDs, right? Okay, this one might be a little bit controversial. <laughs> and your, your mileage may vary here. And like, um, there, I certainly like, there's a time and place for rest for sure. And I think, I'm not sure if anyone, in terms of like a public API that you offer, I, I still think that rest is like a great approach and, and paradigm. 
Uh, but, but if you're building an internal system that needs to talk like uh, across your own network, uh, I really, really recommend you avoid REST. And it, it's even, I mean, let, let me just like map it out. Okay, so if we were to do this REST call, and, and I know half the room already is like, no, that's not how I would do it, right? Um, so if you're new to this post, like some people would want to, this is like a pseudo curl thing. Um, some people would, would want the params to, to look something like this. Some people would want like, you know, a JSON payload to get posted. Some would want to do the JSON thing like this, and others like this. I think you're getting the picture, right? Um, the version might be like this, like Twilio does, something like this. Another way would be to have it in the URL. Even, like, everyone's got a little bit different of a look um, and a flavor for how a REST API, like, would look. And uh, that's totally cool. There's a lot of ways to do it, as long as it's, like, understandable and, and, and easy to use, then, then it's all good. Now, when it comes to, like, using this internally, it, it, it really, like, what, what ends up happening is that everyone consuming the REST API is going to write their own little shim in order to take care of the HTTP <coughs> ceremony. And we even have things like, like status codes, right? And everyone does it a little bit different, whether it's a 4000 or a 409 when, when you get errors. It, it, it gets really, really complex, and it's really needlessly complex. Because what we're doing is we're creating these libraries that run on these machines, and then we want to, we want to abstract it or make it available over HTTP, so we use REST. But then what we're doing is we're creating these SDKs that emulate the library that we were trying to make available over the wire in the first place. So there's a lot of room for bugs, there's a lot of room for inconsistencies, and different team members like will do it a little bit differently and prefer a different flavor of REST every time. So I think like what REST is really good at is when you build a system and you want to expose an API that is <coughs> like, I don't care what you write in, if it's Scala, if it's, if it's Java, whatever, like I want you to be able to interface with us. And I think that exposing a REST API is really good for that use case because you're really saying like, like pick your poison, right? Like any way you want to talk to us, no problem. But internally, like avoid it. It's a productivity killer. So this is ultimately what, what you want, right? With a, with a REST API, I'm, like ultimately you just want to abstract it to something like this, where it's like, hey, I want to set this uh, object and it repairs, return them back, or otherwise give me the record, right? So the way that it talks over the wire is really the implementation you did. Here's another, Here's something that we do with, with our system. So this is just like one function that exposes a library over, over the wire. And, and ultimately all it's doing is like taking the arguments and it's, it's serializing it in JSON. And the, the way that, that like this API that, that we have, it works over the wire or it works locally talking to the database. You can just configure it how you want. But the important thing here is that the, the HTTP is completely abstracted and, and that would have been really challenging to do or, or messy if, if we took a REST approach. Much, much more so than doing something like this. Okay. <laughs> Does anyone want to talk about the REST thing? Or do you want? Wait, can we talk? Yeah, of course. Well, yeah. I, mean, I mean, to me, like, when you showed the code out with, with the set, and you said, like, how that actually happens in implementation detail, like, that could be REST, right? And you can write cl a client library that abstracts away the gnarliness of REST. Yeah, but you can't do it with 30 internal libraries, uh, not, a, not with a team of four. And so 
Uh, you're right, like it can be, but then the, the question is like, okay, so REST, the REST interface to me is, is a human interface. It's not for machines, it's actually for humans, so that when somebody looks at your HTTP API, they can like, they can see how it works, they can maybe predict what other functions look like, and they can interface with it because really you're, you're, you're separate, you're going like to the edge, you're like, okay, this is what we're exposing and this is our, our system and now you need to understand our system and interface with it. So REST is a good way to do that, but internally, what you really want is, in like, internally you have the luxury to pick some technologies and like, and go, okay, we're gonna use, we're gonna use like Node.js and, and maybe Python and, and whatever, right? Like, you're not going to likely use 30 different, like, tools, right? Yeah, but I just take the point. REST might enable you to support 30 different languages, mm -hmm. but like, you don't really mean you have to. I mean, if all of your internal code is JavaScript, mm -hmm. you still have REST, you still have REST on the wire, but only bother with JavaScript libraries on either, either end. Right. And then, in the, in, the, in the event that you don't use REST, then that's fine, but you still have to use something. You're going to be you bespoke. You're going to invent your own protocol that yeah. has its own downsides, or you can pick a different protocol that's not REST. Right. Yeah. So I'm suggesting that you write both sides. So, like, well, what's common is that we expose a REST API, right? Or, like, that, that, that abstracts this layer. And then we even, like, we write SDKs, and, and sometimes, and this is great that, that companies have the resources to do this, but like then like to to have all these SDKs, right? Like your Java SDK and your Ruby SDK and your Node.js SDK, all on top of the REST API. And and this this is great, but my question would be like if we're if we're doing if we're writing providing SDKs to all of our customers for all the different languages, then why under the hood are we introducing this like this layer that that of of like customization like like interfit writing on top of a REST API requires a lot more like custom little stuff than doing something like this right where it's just like completely predictable it it, it um, it treats every method the same, no matter what. Like it's, 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 if there's a bug here, it's going to affect everything equally. Um, so my only suggestion is just like, if it's for you and you just want this machine to talk to this machine on your internal network, um, consider not doing a REST API. Uh, and I, I don't want to talk about REST, so this shouldn't take too long. Um, are what, is what you're doing basically just enabling kind of like a remote method call, remote procedure call? Yeah, it's an RPG. Is yeah. that similar? Do you guys take that idea? I, I'm barely agreeing on, on the Node.js side, but I, I, if I understand correctly, like Meteor and Derby have a sort of similar thing to allow the client to talk to the server in that way. Is that similar to if you're going from system to system then? Yeah, I can't talk specifically about the internals of uh, Meteor but, or Derby, but it, it is like an RPC. Right. So it, it's really like kind of how we were doing HTTP before REST, and I think that the REST movement was really good, like for sure, um, and, and it still has its merits, but it comes at a cost, and just keep in mind that a REST API is for humans, okay? Okay, void SQL. Uh, this is, this is again, like, like, I'm not saying SQL is bad. I'm saying avoid it um, <laughs> if you can. <laughs> and there's certainly like cases, um, and then this is for very similar reasons to REST. It, it's just like, who here has accidentally written a great SQL query? Accidentally written a SQL query that crippled your performance. <laughs> a lot of people. It, it's it's unlikely to accidentally do the right thing with SQL, and I think that if you're extremely proficient in SQL, like 
I'm jealous of you, that's awesome. And and like MySQL and Postgres are amazing databases. They're like battle-hardened, they work, they work really well. Um, but again, it, it's a productivity killer to use it. Um, it's, it's just like inherently complex by its nature. And by the way that we're building these, these web applications today, I, I just don't think it's a very suitable tool for the kinds of things that we're building right now. And so, you know, like we're using SQL in our platform and it's, it's been great for us. Uh, Rob Ellis is, is, is totally comfortable with SQL and that's what's made it like a good tool for us, but it's, it, it does come like, it is slower to use, there's more ceremony, it's, it's difficult to abstract things sometimes, and in, in particular with, with Node.js, Node.js matured in, at a time when a lot of NoSQL databases were, were like coming to the forefront, and, and so I think for, with Node.js, a lot of the adapters for the NodeSQL stuff is a lot more mature than, than uh, the SQL adapters. And so, it, it's not like, my experience in like Ruby is a lot different because Active Record and Data Mapper are very mature libraries that work extremely well. And you can actually be very productive with SQL and in fact, oftentimes more productive than with with some of the newer uh, data stores. But in my experience, that's not the case with Node. Uh, you're more likely to be uh, productive uh, and more likely to build a performance system uh, with, with something that isn't SQL. So a little uh, tidbit on SQL is, is this call in, in MySQL, which is just kind of like, like, it's still a complicated call, uh, but it's, it's the equivalent of set in uh, other than key value stores. So, like, to me this is as simple as it gets with SQL, and it's still like, hey, I just want to set a record. You know, like, it shouldn't be that difficult. Postgres so, doesn't even have that. Sorry? Postgres doesn't even have that. And Postgres doesn't it's, even have this, yeah. It's uh, similar to an upsert in a uh, lot of the SQL databases, uh, or a paired swap and tag. But that's actually really bad to do yeah. on my SQL. Uh, it's, it's not very good at it. It's not good at performance wise no. or yeah. And it's still a little awkward to use to be honest. But. All right, error messages. Um this may seem a little a little redundant, but this is what we do a lot is we, we return messages in two ways. Uh, one is an array and one is like key value. And you'll see there's like a direct uh, mapping between like, like the details of like email must be valid, which is exactly the same as up there. Not in every case it's gonna map like one to one. But what this does is it really like takes a lot of burden off of the client that's consuming uh, your error messages that like if like on your first implementation, you might just like display an array of, of all the errors that you're getting back. On a more like on a more thorough pass, you might want to highlight each field, right? Um, I'm sure we've all done this from time to time. This makes it a whole lot easier, right? And it's not that difficult for your API to expose it this way. So I suggest it. Make it really easy on your client to make good inter like consume your API in a way that makes the user experience good. A couple other like really small details about error messages. So when you get when you get errors back, it's really good when they're detailed, right? Like that your email address isn't long enough, or that title isn't long enough, or or invalid characters. But at the same time, like if you guys you know when you post to a form and you get like all the error messages back, it's like first name must have a length, first name cannot have these characters, first name blah 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 blah. And but it only makes sense to return the error that is relevant to what the user inputted. And so I encourage you to like only return like one error per field. 
which, whichever is the most relevant, whatever made it fail. Uh, but at the same time, don't do just one error at a time, right? Like, like you make the first name valid and then you submit, and it's like, right now it's the last name as a problem, okay? And that's not good either. So you need to find a good balance between the two. And to me, that is like one error per field, but return all the errors for that record that has a problem. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. Okay, Redis. Um, I'm, this is, talk really isn't about like technology, like a, um, really just use what works for you, but we, we found Redis to be a very useful tool in our stack, and that is because it, it like, it's, it's useful and it's so versatile. And, and so it's basically on every single machine in our system and we use it for caching and we use it in some cases as a persistent database. Um, and that's okay, like you can configure Redis to be, um, to be persistent. There's a couple of things that you need to, to be aware of. Um, one is that like if your, your data set needs to sit in memory. Okay, so if you have a lot of data or this, um, this data set could grow to like gig, gigabytes or terabytes, then I would say like you probably shouldn't use Redis. But there's a lot of data stores where it's like, hey, even if we had thousands, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of customers, like it's still going to be megs, right? And when that is when that is the case, like totally look at consider using Redis because it's it's extremely easy to use and has great um, as a great API. Um, so in terms of the, the persistent or the durability, you have to configure it. Uh, you can you can configure it to in the background sync to disk like every second. You can also tell it to um, to persist on every write. Uh, which it just really depends on what your use case is. Like we have, we have some cases where where the data is extremely read heavy. Um, there's not a lot of it, and so the writes are so uh, so infrequent that we just persist it every time. And um, but it's durable. It's completely durable and autonomous. Um, so we use this library called Thug for this. I'm going to open it up. So this is essentially our ORM, and this is the whole thing on this page, with the exception of like eight lines. Um, but it, it basically does all those things that I mentioned in terms of returning error codes and stuff. So it's 207 lines of code, and we're using this like instead of like a, a mongoose, instead of uh, active record kind of thing, like. We're doing all our validations and error passing through through this library that can be used client side or server side. And I'm not I'm not telling you to use this library. I'm telling you that like build sometimes just build something for your use case like that that does exactly what you need, and it's often just not that difficult. Um, so, anyways, back to. Um, we use it for our customer data store that uses that uh, HTTP call. Um, the error messages are, are as I posted. It's kind of like a library that encapsulates a lot of things that I just mentioned. But I don't think I'm going to talk a lot about it. So, um, okay, messaging. Okay. So messaging is something that I've talked a lot about. I think like half of the room heard me speak about messaging. Has anyone here like tried zero MQ out or like experimented more with messaging since hearing we talk about it? Okay, a few. All right. I encourage you guys to do it. Like um, in, in 2008, we were at... Uh, Burb camp, and there was a, a talk there that, that talked about not using HTTP, and that was kind of an eye-opener for me. And it, it took a while for a lot of those principles to sink in, but it was 
and talked a lot about using TCP and, and messaging. And and when you when you break out of HTTP and start to think in other patterns and using messaging systems, it's a whole new types of possibilities open up. So like, I'd really encourage you to, to try it out and like look at Zero MQ. It it's worked for us because it's it's very easy to use. It's like the the complex part is is learning the messaging patterns and, and figuring out which um, which patterns are going to work for your system. Because unfortunately it's it's probably a different architecture to, for every problem. So you do have to pay a little bit of, you gotta invest a little bit of time and effort into like learning what's going to work for you and like what, what trade-offs you're willing to make and what, um, where you're, you want your bottlenecks to be or where you want your risk to live. Uh, but once you, once you get to, once you know what those are and you know the different patterns, then you can really kind of tailor a, a, a system that is going to work really well for your system and it's going to put the risk where you want it to be, where you're comfortable with it. And, and so anyway, the, the basic messaging pass, patterns are just like push-pull and that is like something that we almost always start with, which is like we have something that's really expensive so we put it in the background. Uh, but there's a few others that you should know because if you put something in the background, you want to keep tabs on that without like pulling a database or something like that. Because pulling, like it's not that it's, it's less ideal from like a, a purity standpoint, but also it's complex to pull and you're just pushing complexity somewhere else, right? So, <clears throat> so learn about request re reply. It's very similar to just like uh, HTTP call. It's synchronous and it's very useful. Um, it, there's not, I don't think like, like async and sync calls do not need to, um, they're not mutually exclusive. Like sometimes it's very convenient to just reach out to a machine and say, like, hey, can you give me this little like piece of information, or can you tell me how much load you have, or or whatever. Um, there's times when you need to synchronously reach out to a machine and get a response back, and to have to pull for like trivial pieces of data that are not expensive to, for the other machine to get. It is silly, right? So, um, so set up your your messaging so that you can can synchronously get the information that you need. And for expensive things, you can you can you can uh, distribute it out to your machines, but you can also observe how the progress of that is going. And of course, pubs up. Those are the basics. Um, I would also like encourage you to know about pairing. Um, and you can do really cool things with messaging. So try it out. So this is kind of like, you know, to, to tie it back to the complexity. Um, when we're often in these situations where like I think we're conditioned to to think that there's always a compromise that will save us time. So when we think of what the right way to build something is. Uh, we think of like, oh yeah, well I'll have to write this library and this library and I'll have to set up a database here or whatever. Um, and that would be perfect if that was written that way. But um, I think I can make a shortcut that will save us time and that will get us almost there. And like you certainly want to make those, those trade-offs when they're definitely a significant win. But sometimes, when you just know what the right way is to build something, it's actually just faster and easier to build it properly. Um, and sometimes there isn't that win. There isn't that thing that will take half the amount of time and be 90% as good. And so when you do, when you sometimes chase the band-aid, you end up spending more time on it, or you pay that debt down later, and you have to like, fix it or revise it, and 
if you can, if you know what the right thing is to build or how to design something, just build it that way. And only when you don't know what that right thing is, then do the minimum to, to fix the problem. Um, so, announcement, Heart Platform is going public this week. Um, Yay! We hope to announce it, like, it's coming out, it's imminent. So, we're hoping that you guys can maybe, like, we actually have taken off the shackles right now. And uh, so this is a soft launch right now. If you guys want to kick the tires, you can sign up right now at heart.io. And uh, if, if you encounter some problems or bugs or if you break something, that would be awesome if you can do it as soon as possible and let us know. Um, and, um, and yeah, check it out. It would be really useful. And uh, on Friday, we're having a party at Stackhouse to celebrate. Um, it will be after the Cascadia party, so it'll be a late, late night party probably. When's Cascadia things finishing up? Hmm, good question, Brock. Uh, I don't know, what, what time do you think of starting your party? <laughs> <laughs> it, okay. <laughs> you know, don't worry, people, we're going to figure this out. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, maybe we need to talk. My understanding is that, that the port side is the party uh, for Cascadia, and that the bar stars will be arriving, um, like, you know, probably like 10 or 11, so I don't know. So we will we'll be making that information more um, coherent soon. But anyways, thanks for listening, and hope you guys got something.